Welcome to the Black Sparrow Media Internet Broadcast Network. Listening to Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a podcast about Linux, open source, and amateur radio for everyone. Now, here are your hosts Russ, K5TUX, Cheryl, W5MOO, and Bill, NE4RD. Well, hello everybody and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 474 of the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. This is Linux in the Hamshack. And this is our Short Topics episode, and we hope you are all doing well, and we hope you enjoy the topics we have for you tonight or today or whenever you're listening to this. And uh, we should probably, without further ado, just go ahead and dive into it. But before we do that, we introduce ourselves, because if I don't, everybody jumps all over me because I didn't (laughs) say we need to introduce ourselves, even though we're already introduced in the intro. But of course, some people don't listen to the intro. So let's introduce ourselves. I'm Russ, K5TUX. Cheryl, W5MOO, is on assignment this week and will not be joining us. And I'm Bill, NE4RD. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into our short topics. And we don't have a lead topic for this recording, so we'll get right into amateur radio. And we'll let Bill tackle article number one. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, Electrostatic Discharge Protection, ESD. Is it still needed? So this was a guest post over on the QRP or blog, which I uh, I do frequent uh, looking at some of the stories there. And this one was from uh, uh, Paul, W0RW. And he says, improper handling of electronic assemblies with microcircuits during testing, production, and repair can still cause catastrophic and latent damage. Uh, designers have developed protection methods that reduce ESD susceptibility after the product is completely packaged. So you might not need, you might not see any damage to the final products. But those who build or repair electronic assemblies still have to take precautions not to damage items. Uh, This is the most important ESD fact. Static is generated by the contact and separation of unlike materials. That means you probably are the biggest ESD hazard around your workbench. Uh, When you get up out of your chair, many many thousands of volts can be generated. Grounded wrist straps prevent damage to this. Humidity is a big factor in reducing ESD damage. If you live near the ocean, you won't have as much ESD susceptibility as someone who was working in Colorado, where, you know, the humidity is like, you know, double, you know, like 10, 15, 20 (laughs) percent. It's not only electronics that are affected by ESD. Perhaps you have seen the ESD warning signs at gas pumps, uh, people sliding out of the car that is being fuel has caused fires. Filling metal gas cans and pickup trucks with bed liners can be hazardous. The only safe way to fill a gas can is to place it on the ground. And uh, they also link to the ESD Association for training, and we uh, included that link here in the post. And we also included the uh, link to, of course, the QRP, QRP or blog post that this uh, that this was on. And uh, I thought it was kind of uh, you know since we talked about grounding not too long ago, this is kind of another another grounding issue <laughs> where you need to reduce your potential against the potential of all the equipment you're working on on your bench. So, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of important if you are a hobbyist. And I think we even talked about kits the last time. And that's also important when building kits. Yep. Absolutely. I've gotten myself into the habit of any time I'm at a gas station, anytime I, before I do anything, regardless of whether I've been in and out of the car or fueling up or anything, I always touch a metal part of the pump or something connected to the ground. Just so, you know, <laughs> if there is a latent spark somewhere, I'm not going to be it. <laughs> yeah that's but, a good idea <laughs> yeah i mean i just it probably looks weird because i'm like walking around touching things randomly <laughs> but you know better safe than sorry i suppose although the whole thing about cell phones is a load of crock <laughs> uh, so, cell phones are not going to ignite a gas pump but i mean always better to to ground yourself anyway you know i've gone my whole life so long not using like grounding straps like if i'm in a data center or something like that I never ground myself to the 
you know, to the racks or the chassis or anything like that. I don't use those wrist straps. I don't do anything like that. And I've never burned anything up. And I've done that for so long. I feel like if I ever started doing that, I would kill something. So <laughs> you introduce a new, uh, a new variable to the equation, right? Right. <laughs> so I've done everything wrong for so long. I have a fear of doing it right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but probably in more than one aspect of my life, but you know, that is what's... <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's move on. Our next topic is, is field day still relevant? Ooh, this is the only time radio amateurs actually get on the air. So, I mean, in that way, it's still relevant, right? <laughs> uh, Dan, KB6NU posted an interesting perspective on his field day 2022 experience and leaves us with a couple of questions to ponder. Is field day still relevant? This year was a lot better. Our club was a 3A, but even so, attendance was way down, noting that and noting that and noting all the single operator stations, I'm beginning to wonder if field day is still relevant. I've always described field day as a combination club, social event, emergency preparedness exercise, and public relations event. And I think that's actually what it's supposed to be. With so many single operator stations, it's certainly not much of a club event, and I doubt that the 1B, 1D, and 1E ops are doing much public relations. Well, that's probably true. I suppose that the 1B and 1E stations are exercising some of their emergency communications capabilities, but a lot of training is now required to really take part in emergency comm. I'm not sure that knowing that your generator is working and how to start it would be all that valuable in a real emergency situation. Well, you should know how to start your generator, right? <laughs> That's kind of, uh, kind of important. <laughs> kind of important, yeah. You know, I have all these generators here, and last year I actually did run as an emergency power station for, for what I did, which wasn't much, but... Yeah. yeah. And uh, following that, he says, should field day encourage more VHF and UHF operation? Another reason that makes me wonder about the relevance of field day is that the operation mostly takes place on HF. Sure, some clubs have VHF and UHF stations, but I'd say that those are the exception rather than the rule. Well, except for me, I was operating only on six meters this time because my antenna, he'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> And since the majority of licensed TAMs are tax, how appealing is it for them to come out and participate in field day? Well, because they can operate HF. Isn't that the whole idea? You know, the GOTA stuff? Getting getting yeah, those the techs well. interested in HF? So, also, most emergency communications now take place on VHF, UHF, and above. How is making rapid-fire CW contacts on 80 meters training people to be better at emergency communications? Hmm. Well, <coughs> so... I mean, <laughs> doing any kind of communication is training, right? I mean, it's practice. That's so. right. Well, let's uh, let's just uh, kind of just tear apart this because uh, you know a lot of people are leaving comments on his website and blog, which I suggest that you do if you have some comments and thoughts to this as well. But uh, since we have a podcast, we'll just go ahead and publicly say all of our comments. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, the uh, so I I'd, I'd kind of say that the maybe the one Delta stations are those you know home base stations guaranteed and, and of course a one echo station is that's a, a home station running on emergency power but a one bravo station is actually somebody out on battery so a battery that has not been charged by well and what what should be i think electrical mains <laughs> right like solar <laughs> so or something it yeah. should be charged by some other property so the one bravo people are probably the uh, most uh practicing their emergency communications capabilities, you know, completely off the grid. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I think, I think as well, the, the conditions on that weekend weren't that great. <laughs> and uh, that always kind of puts a downer in most people's uh, uh, thoughts and uh, concerns with, uh, with, with field day, you know, whether the activity is high and stuff like that. But I also think that uh, a lot of people were playing on digital modes, which then also degrades the amount of single sideband and CW contacts and stuff like that. So I think like that's kind of my initial thought on the relevancy and what the purpose is. Um, I came from, you know, doing field day down in Florida. Uh, not, not this time, obviously, <laughs> but when I was a super active field there, uh, we would generally run anywhere from three alpha to uh, five alpha, and we would make it a huge camping event, which, of course, yeah, there you go. It's a club event. Um, it's also totally on uh, generators, so uh, completely off um, mains and stuff like that. In fact, we were 
out in the middle of the, what we'd call the boonies, and uh, there was nothing out there. So <laughs> this is that's that's the way to do it, I think. Uh, the PR wouldn't have helped because you'd have to come find us in the middle of the Everglades, which uh, we weren't in a very uh, uh, popular spot for visitors and guests, except for one year we did have somebody show up with a gun, <laughs> some drunk guy, and scared the crap out of everybody. <clears throat> but uh, I digress on that. <laughs> this was back in the 80s or 90s. So, um, And uh, as for the VHF, UHF, operation those uh, alpha stations are given a free uh vhf uhf station meaning that if you're three alpha that means you have three stations on on hf you can have a fourth station that's dedicated to vhf and of course not only that you can also have the get on the air station which could be a fifth station as well um which you you know normally run your guests through and visitors and stuff like that Obviously, everybody operating under the call sign of the main station, which is running on HF, would be under a general class control operator or higher. So, you know, tech technicians and stuff like that could easily operate HF all day long on, on field day because it's all being ran under a, under a call sign of a control operator of a higher class license. So that should be no, no, no thing there. But I can tell you as a, as an alpha station in the past, like we really wanted that free VHF station because during VH during field day, of course, is a high amount of a six meter activity. And we would always have a dedicated six meter, you know, operator running. And then in the mornings and stuff like that, when six meters wouldn't, wouldn't be operating, we'd try two meters and four forty for doing, uh, you know, things like meteor scatter and also tropo and stuff like that, where you can get some enhanced propagation on VHF. And, uh, I think he made mention in his uh, comments about using VHF and UHF and FM. And, you know, my opinion on that <laughs> is that technicians need to learn how to operate uh, all mode uh, in VHF, UHF, because that, is, of course, is always better because you can now get into, you know, uh, the linear birds uh, for satellites. You can also get into using your favorite HF mode, you know, your FT8 and your FT4s on VHF and UHF. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all mode, I think, is the, the critical component when you start getting into that free VHF, UHF station uh, in the alpha groups. And uh, I don't know, like, you know, he mentions as well that, uh, you know, adding extra points for it. But I think the incentive for the, uh, the alpha stations is that it is a free station. So every contact you make on there is basically extra points that don't really that aren't penalized by your station size. So there's already a bonus aspect to that. What do you think? Well, I have to say I pretty much agree with everything you've said there. Did, did you want to distill all that down into an opinion on the relevance of Field Day? <laughs> I mean, there was there was there was a lot said there, and I agree with with all of it entirely. But yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good exercise and it's definitely a good PR event and good club event. Um, and, you know, if people that couldn't make it out to those events didn't participate, it would be even worse. So, <clears throat> you know, I think it's relevant. I mean, the, the growth that uh, Winterfield Day has been seeing has, uh, you know, kind of shown that same same kind of relevancy to doing an event at that time of year. Um, I think, I think it's just, just kind of just going through the ebb and flow of the changes of the hobby. Uh, and of course the, the, the solar activity didn't help that weekend. So, yeah, I mean, I could see how a three alpha would be slightly disappointed in, uh, the contact load, but, uh, you should definitely be getting all those technicians on HF and that's a great time for them to practice in like a really non complicated exchange type contest, Unlike like sweepstakes, uh, which is kind of the the big event that I love, is really a pain for a lot of those operators because you know it has a very long exchange and it's it's kind of complex in that that aspect. So I think it's perfectly relevant and it's a fun event and it brings a lot of people together. And in some cases, it might be their only big club event where they you know maybe have a a nice potluck together and stuff like that. And some of the smaller clubs, so. I think it's still relevant. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And that's my experience with Field Day, and it has been all along. The two clubs that I've been associated with, the one here in Missouri and the one up in Maine, it is their major event. It is the one that brings most of the club members together, and it does engage with the public. And it also allows those tech operators to get on the air and everything. And 
for that reason, it's it's also the proof of concept that when the bands seem to be dead, all you have to do is have a contest, and suddenly they're not dead anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I, I, I definitely think it's still relevant. I think it's one of the things that really keeps amateur radio in the forefront of anybody's mind when, when it comes to the topic um, generally. And uh, like a, like you said, the growth of Winterfield Day, I think, is is helping out with that, too. And it's keeping it on a six-month cycle instead of a one-year cycle, which should help just in general with getting people interested. So my thoughts and yours, I think, are uh, pretty congruous. <laughs> yeah, so if you have something different to say or thoughts, you can send us some notes or uh, send it over there on the KB6NU blog, which is always, always a great read. So uh, head on over that way. All right. Fantastic. And I'll just uh, hit this next one so we can so we can read our own articles going forward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so lastly, in amateur radio, we have the call for amateur radio speakers for the September 2022 QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is live. It'll be on the 17th and 18th coming up this year. And they would like international speakers on any amateur radio subject. Application deadline for being a speaker is August 15th. And video uploads are due by September 1st. Are, what, are, what are we doing? Are we going to do an, like a pre-recorded presentation? I know we sort of said we don't really want to do um, that. But I'm thinking about it. Are we if going I can to? put something together, then I'll uh, I'll submit it to uh, to to them and uh, as a proposal. And we'll see if we get in. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that might be the, the best way to kind of tiptoe our way back into uh, participation. Yeah. And at least then... We can't. We won't have the issues we had with the live presentation last time. I think that's w what our strong suit is. But I, I think it's um, reasonable for us to participate. And if this is the way we have to do it, yeah, then sounds good to me. I guess we'll do it that way. All right, cool. Well, let's move on to open source topics then. And interestingly, both of the topics we picked for the open source <laughs> segment are both about Microsoft and both about the Software Freedom Conservancy. Oh. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, popular, two interrelated uh, topics. Popular uh, topic right now. Microsoft is uh, <laughs> causing some uh, causing some waves in the in the kiddie pool. Um, yeah, but here it is: Microsoft to ban commercial open source from App Store. A few weeks ago, Microsoft quietly updated its Microsoft uh, App Store policies, adding new policies which go into effect next week, and that would be this coming week, I guess. Uh, and it would include include that. Uh, sorry, that would include this text. All pricing must not attempt to profit from open source or other software that is otherwise generally available for free, meaning in price, not freedom. And see, yesterday, a number of Microsoft Store users discovered this and started asking questions. Quickly, those of us, including our own organization, of course, this is the uh, uh, SF Conservancy, um, uh, so that provide free and open source software via the Microsoft Store, started asking our own questions, too. While Microsoft has acknowledged that the ensuing community outrage, they have not clarified their policy. In the meantime, this clause reverses longstanding App Store policies and is already disrupting commerce on their platform with its tight countdown clock to implementation. In particular, Microsoft now forbids FOSS redistributors from charging any money for nearly all FOSS, uh, i.e. profit, since all legitimate FOSS is already available, at least in source code form, somewhere for free. As there's a lot of parentheses in this. This term, when enacted, will apply to all FOSS. Uh, FOSS. <laughs> uh, selling open source software has been a cornerstone of open source's sustainability since its inception, precisely because you can sell it. Open source projects like Linux, which Microsoft claims to love, have been uh, estimated to be worth billions of dollars. Uh, Microsoft apparently does not want any FOSS developers to be able to write open source in a sustainable way. And uh, they do clarify later on that uh, Microsoft, somebody has responded at Microsoft and, and is currently delaying this policy. Um, and as well, I read uh, over on uh, Brian Lunduk's uh, Substack, he had a great, uh, great article, Microsoft begins extinguish phase of dealing with open source. And he talks about this topic as well, which is a mighty fine read if you want to go and listen to Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah he talks about like you know uh developing programs like Krita and stuff like that that have been using this as a source of revenue to pay for their on staff uh on staff um uh, programmers and stuff like that the ones that actually get paid for these open source projects uh this has been a source of revenue that apparently or seemingly is uh possibly going away in the very very near future 
So this is a pretty big deal. And, uh, you know, for, you know, for the, I don't, I can't even think of a good argument for, <laughs> for supporting Microsoft in this decision. It's just, it's just basically bad. I mean, every, every open source project needs the ability to, to gather funding one way or the other. And if uh, adding the availability to the, to the app store is one of those ways, I mean, yes, if you don't want to buy Krita or don't want to buy GIMP or I don't even know if GIMP is sold on there, but if you don't want to buy those programs, yes, you can just go directly to the sites, download it and install it. But for like users that have, let's say what Windows S, which I think is locked into only installing store-based applications, you've now cut off an entire uh, customer base that uh, cannot even install these applications locally on their uh, Microsoft operating systems. So uh, yeah, this is just, just bad 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 so yeah <laughs> this is the this is definitely the extinguish i almost agree with <laughs> ryan lunduk in this that uh you know the uh what is it ex embrace extend and extinguish was the uh original thoughts of how microsoft is dealing with uh, uh, uh open source and it uh it, it seems it seems uh s seems pretty true <laughs> which is not not good especially with microsoft having so much uh, exposure to the open source uh, market as they do now right and a lot of their code is built into the linux kernel and everything else so yeah i can see where this is going to be problematic they're trying to force people into paid type services and essentially closed source software again so yeah not not cool <laughs> But that's why the Software Freedom Conservancy is involved in this, because it's anti-software freedom. So, And in a related story, the Software Freedom Conservancy urges giving up GitHub. Now, I think a lot of people have already sort of jumped on this bandwagon and are moving to places like GitLab and other things that don't have some of GitHub's policies. But this story says, the Software Freedom Conservancy, SFC, or SFUC, has issued a strong call for the free software projects to give up GitHub and to move their repositories elsewhere. There are a number of problems that the SFC has identified with the GitHub code hosting service and in particular with its Copilot AI based code writing tool that was trained on the community's code stored in the company's repositories. Moving away from GitHub will not be easy, SFC said, but it is important to do so lest the free software community repeat the SourceForge mistake. SourceForge is like synonymous <laughs> with mistake, I think. <laughs> Um, and I feel bad for, for people like, uh, Andy's ham radio Linux, which is distributed via SourceForge. You need to move that over to GitLab or something. Uh, quotes from the SFC last week after we reminded GitHub of a, the pending questions that we'd waited a year for them to answer and B of their refusal to join public discussion on the topic. They responded a week later saying they would not join any public or private discussion on the matter because a broader conversation about the ethics of AI-assisted software seemed unlikely to alter the SFC's stance, which is why we, GitHub, have not responded to your detailed questions. In other words, GitHub's copilot, or sorry, in other words, GitHub's final position on copilot is, if you disagree with GitHub about policy matters related to copilot, then you don't deserve a reply from Microsoft or GitHub. They only want to bother to reply if they think they can immediately change your policy position to theirs. Hmm. That sounds like a company we've heard of, <laughs> but yeah, so there's a thing. And if anybody didn't know, Microsoft, do they own it? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. So yes, yeah, so if you're, if you're using GitHub, you know, given these, these two stories, you might want to consider using something else. Is there, yeah, you is can there host a, your own? Yeah, yeah you, you can, can host, you. absolutely. Is a, I mean, GitLab is obviously a major alternative to GitHub, but are there others? Yeah, Gitea is one you can self-host. Uh, that's G-I-T-E-A, um, and there's probably other ones too. But um, but yeah, <laughs> there's definitely alternatives. I did actually I did read an article about Copilot, and Copilot, if you're not familiar, is the uh, the AI assisted code completer that you do have to pay for. It's a paid service. I believe it's like it's something crazy. It's like a hundred bucks a month or something something like that. Anyway, you can check GitHub site for the pricing on that. But I hear that, like, if you're running, if you're using it against, say, I don't know, like a Ruby on Rails or Django project or Flask or something like that, you know, runs pretty well because there's a lot of examples and stuff like that. But if you're getting on more, you know, newer stuff, let's say like Fast API or something like that, that the uh, code completions aren't that great. 
<laughs> so if you're actually using something that's fairly new, it's not quite up to date as well. But um, I, I don't really see how any how Git or the Copilot is any different than someone copy pasta and from you know um, Stack Overflow, <laughs> which happens right happens a lot in code code problems is as generally anytime you run into a debug issue and you're trying to fix it and then you go straight to stack overflow and you're like, Oh, that looks like a solution. I'm using <laughs> <laughs> right. copy paste. And, uh, well, who uh, hasn't Googled for code snippets or modules or, you know, uh, methods on, you know, for, for, for doing something they didn't want to write that's already out there. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's already been like a pervasive activity anyway. And this get, this copilot basically just latches onto that style of, uh, of, of coding, <laughs> which is using, you know, the examples and previous, uh, previous, uh, you know, previously written code to, to generate uh, code blocks for you. Yeah. So anyway, some, some things to consider when, when doing coding, if, if you're a coder type person. So, and both of those stories came from the SFC and links to additional information will of course be in the show notes. So let's move on to Linux in the ham shack. And Bill's going to tell us about the latest wonderment coming out of the physics. What is it? MIT, right? That's where this stuff where WSJTX comes out of. So, um, I think so. I mean, that's, uh, I'm pretty sure that's where, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, it's WSJTX. Princeton. Princeton. Oh, Princeton. It's no, Princeton. Not MIT. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was like, it didn't sound right. But... No, you're right. <laughs> and it didn't sound right to me anyway, but I was like, uh, I don't know. It's one of those Ivy League schools. So, <laughs> yes, Princeton. So, anyway, yeah, this is, uh, I didn't even know this happened. This happened a few weeks ago. Uh, WSJTX 2.6.0 release candidate one is out. Uh, WSJTX uh, 2.6.0 RC1 introduces support for the ARRL International Digital Contest, performance enhancements for FTA, Q65, and EME Echo Mode, uh, new controls and options on the GUI, and several bug fixes. So some of the things you can uh, see in uh, WSJTX is improved decoding for FT8, including additional messages that are marked A7, improved decoding for Q65 when the AP is used, um, let's see here. Optional new active stations window and other features supporting the ARRL International Digital Contest. Accurate SNR measurements in echo mode. Let's see here. We'll scroll down a little bit. Uh, uh, let's see. A optional highlighting for the DX call and DX grid and uh, messages containing R R R73 or just 73. Uh, new options for writing to your all.txt file. Excuse me. For uh, those of you still using that to parse everything out of with the uh, external programs, uh, some other uh, auto reply for non CQ messages via UDP. That's stuff that you have connected apps for, like JT Alert and whatnot. I guess uh, um, what's the grid tracker would also be within that spec that uses the UDP to send messages back and forth. Uh, suppression, uh, suppressed transmission of blank messages. Uh, suppression of self-spotting when running multiple instances. That's that's interesting. Uh, let's see. Uh, corrected a few flaws with the, the auto sequencing logics, a uh, flaw in whisper mode, and uh, a flaw that could use OmniRig 1.19 or later to set incorrect, incorrect frequencies after initialization. Uh, so, yeah, it looks like a lot of little fixes here and there and some uh, some slight improvements. So uh, probably getting ready for that uh, ARRL International Digital Contest. So I'm going to have to uh, download that myself, which I didn't have time to do, and uh, take a look at that. Yep, I'm definitely going to take a look at it. I try and keep my WS my WSJTX as updated as possible, although I'm technically using WSJTZ right now. But, you know, it's, it's, I guess I can go back to the original thing because I don't do any of the automated stuff that WSJTZ gives you. So, yeah. I'll just go back to the, the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And this next story I found on a, a weird source, thanks to Google. And it's it's not specific to ham radio, but it's ham radio adjacent because it's about CubeSats. And we know that CubeSats support amateur radio communication often. So it's a USB standard for satellites. And this is universal satellite something, not serial bus. So <laughs> here's the story. Testing new satellites and space technologies has never been easy exactly, but it could certainly be easier. 
Slingshot 1, a 12U CubeSat mission that just launched via Virginia Orbit, is an attempt to make building and testing new satellite as easy as plugging a new keyboard into your computer. To say that it is USB for space is simplistic, but not wrong. The Aerospace Corporation team that designed the new system makes a comparison themselves, noting that the military has made several attempts to create just what the space plug-and-play, SPA, architecture, which is, which is, became, uh, this is yeah, cut and paste, <laughs> the modular open network architecture or monarch, and the common payload interface standard, Copace, but the approaches didn't take off like, say, the standard CubeSat, which, by the way, Aerospace also pioneered. Slingshot One's goal is to create a standard satellite bus. That's it, satellite bus, universal satellite bus. That is an adaptable and easy to use as USB, the other USB, or ATX, using open standards, but also meeting all necessary requirements for safety, power, etc. How will it avoid the common pitfall encountered by aspiring standard setters immortalized by XKCD? There are now N plus one standards. Well... Leaving aside the rather deplorable state of standards in the satellite world, if any, the team decided to base it all on Ethernet, which already underpins a huge amount of networking in the world. Combine that with a power hub that can intelligently meet a variety of needs and a modular case that makes the whole thing look like the back of a neatly organized gaming PC, and you've got a plug-and-play recipe. Play which really makes things easy for the future designer. Data will arrive from Slingshot as it tests its many components and experiments over the coming months, it could be the start of a new modular era for small satellites. So, I don't know if I have any commentary on that. <laughs> the article is much longer, so if you want to read all of the rest of it, uh, it's in uh, mostly intelligible English. It came from the uh, the Barat Express News, and I have no idea where Barat is or what Barat is, but... That's I was where it complaining came. about my ad blocker when I go to the website, so I, I can't look at it right now. Yeah, and I'm not going to. <laughs> but anyway, a link to the article is in the show notes, and you can check that out if you like. And if you're into satellite communications, this might be particularly relevant to you. All right, so moving away from our topics, we're going to get into announcements and feedback. We do have some feedback, and Bill has one announcement. And you know what? I haven't done this yet. I haven't listened. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't that great, but, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I, we mentioned last time that uh, I was appearing on the Linux Labs podcast. I'd already recorded it. Uh, that episode did come out before the one that they had in the can already. So you can find it uh, on uh, your podcatcher or whatever you're using. Uh, it's a Season 7, Episode 10, uh, entitled, You Wouldn't Download a Radio. So, interesting Interesting topic, <laughs> interesting title <laughs> for uh, for the podcast. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not bad. I listened to it. It was okay. <laughs> it didn't sound like a complete idiot, except for I kept going backwards because we were kind of broad brushing stuff. And then I wanted to go back and go into a little bit more detail. And I'm sure I missed lots of lots of lots of details because we talked pretty much just about amateur radio and why uh, and, and how that could be used uh, for you know, their listeners and stuff like that, that are just, you know, maybe pure Linux users and stuff like that. So, so it was, it was a fun, it was a fun conversation and uh, we had a, had a good time and there was a conversation at the end that we thought we were going to take out of the podcast, but we just left in anyway. So um, yeah, just an interesting conversation and always, a, always a good time to, uh, to chat with others about uh, amateur radio and of course, you know, plugging Linux in the ham shack over there quite often. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, very good. All right, we do have a couple of bits of feedback that I want to get to. These are both voicemails, which we haven't had a lot of in the past few months. So let's go ahead and hit these. The first one is from Steve. So I'll push the button, and we'll hear what Steve has to say. Hey, uh, Steve, K3FZT, Kilo 3, Fox, Zulu, Tango. Uh, listen to your uh, ham shack hotline uh, piece. Um, I padded in with uh, Yeelank uh, T4 uh, 48S uh, for more than six months, and I'm fascinated by all the other things you're talking about. I'd love for you to uh, uh, take up uh, some of the detail. Um, also, I tried to dial into your PBX, and I clearly didn't get the number right. So we'll try that again. 
K3, episode T73. All right. Well, thank you, Steve, for sending me the message. And I have not received a call from you still. So either the, uh, you still have the number wrong, uh, or you just well, have the number again. Yes. Give them the number again. The, the number for my PBX line is 610000595. Yeah, there's a lot of zeros in there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my direct line that doesn't go through the PBX is six one five zeros and then eight one one. So that's how you get me on Hamshack Hotline. If you happen to be a, a HOIP or Hams over IP user, my extension is what the hell is my extension? Um, one hundred two hundred one zero zero two zero zero. So. Maybe that's that much easier. Yeah, that's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, those those are ways you can reach me on the uh, ham ham related VoIP services. So, and thanks for sending in the feedback. And we will definitely be looking at a more detailed episode on the PBX side of these VoIP services coming up uh, as soon as we can get to it. There's a lot of topics in the pipeline. So, but we will be definitely doing it. And please stay tuned. And then I had another one from Richard. I can't play all of this one because he, he uh, puts out personal information, but I'll play the part of it that I can. If y'all would, somebody give me a call. Um, I went to Dayton, and somebody was telling me about some uh, cheap jump drives I order off of Amazon. Name's Richard Prescott. Yeah, that, that's the part I <laughs> – that's as far as I can go. That's the rest of it's his phone number. So cheap Cheap jump drives. Yeah, we were talking about the thumb drives that we order to bring to Hamvention. And what we do is we look for bulk thumb drives on Amazon. And generally speaking, what pops up are the ones from, I don't know how you actually pronounce this, but it's Cushion, uh, K-O-O-T-I-O-N. And they're USB thumb drives. And the 16 gig ones come out at like three bucks a piece. So they're they're pretty inexpensive. And for the ones we bring to him, to him mentioned, those are the ones we buy. So and they seem to be pretty solid. So if you're looking for those on Amazon, that's what I would suggest. So look for bulk thumb drives or bulk USB drives, and then specifically the brand name Cushion. And uh, you'd probably be all right with that. So I, I'll give him a call at the number he provided and, and give him that same information. But if he's listening to the show, then there's your answer. And that's all I've got in the way of feedback. And we've covered the announcements as well. And I think that brings us down to the the new subscribers and so on. And, of course, Cheryl's not here to do that this time, so I guess I will go ahead and do it. So for new subscribers, supporters, and live participants to the show, for this week we had on Facebook, Cal Gibson, Dave Austin, Alexander Rakovitis, or Rakovitis, however it is, Gary Graham, James Paul, Kevin Fontes, and N. Andre Papanya Aika. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> uh, nothing on Twitter, nothing on YouTube. Mailing list. Uh, wow, well, the mailing list. I guess I should bring this up again. There is a mailing list. <laughs> Woohoo! And people are actually signing up to it again. So it's over on groups.io. Just search for LHS. There's two mailing lists, LHS and LHS-announce. Uh, the purposes of those should be obvious, so you should probably sign up for both of them. And uh, if you do, You'll get a mention over here, and we had some new folks, Justin Overfelt, Connor, KD9LSV, Bill, AG5ZN, and Ian, November Victor for Charlie. And uh, some new folks on Discord. We had Mel, N8PHV, and oh, Bill put these lying. in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> I should just put these down here. Let's see, we'll move these two out of there. There we go. <laughs> All right, fantastic. And for the live listeners to episode 474, we had Mel, N8PHV, Stacy, KB7, Yankee, Sierra, and Tony, and, or yeah, and K4XSS, so, who probably wasn't in listening. He was probably listening to the Braves crush us, I think. <laughs> I think. Oh! Braves. Yeah, no. <laughs> anyway, that brings us down to the end of the show. This has been our short topics episode. We hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned a little and maybe it generated some discussion from some of our topics. And we really hope you have a great week and we'll tune into our next episode, which we're doing. What are we doing? Weekender, right? 
Yes. Yes. We're doing a weekender next and then we'll have a interview on our deep dive following that. And I'll just confirm with him one more time. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. We had a little interruption because of our uh, death in the family, I guess. And uh, so, yeah, we'll be doing another weekender in a week's time and then in two weeks we'll have a deep dive and then we'll sort of be back on track again. So tune in for all of that. And we hope you have a great life in the meantime. This has been episode number 474 of Linux in the Ham Shack. And for the on assignment, Cheryl, W5MOO, I'm Russ, K5TUX. And I'm Bill, NE4RD73. Thank you for listening to this episode of Linux in the Ham Shack. LHS is a community sponsored podcast. Our website is located at lhspodcast.info. You can support the podcast by visiting the LHS Patreon page at patreon.com stroke LHS podcast or by using the contribute list on the homepage. We have a presence on Discord, Facebook, IRC, Twitter and YouTube. You can also drop us an email at info at lhspodcast.info or leave us a voicemail at one 909 NHS show. That's 1-909-547-7469. Visit the online LHS merchandise store at shop.lhspodcast.info for fun and fashionable show-themed merchandise. Until next time, remember to always heed your hedonisms.